Hello everybody, this is Dr. Beter. Today is February 16, 1976, and this is my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 9. According to Federal Government decree, this is the day that we are to observe the birthday of George Washington, although of course he was born on February 22. This is just a tiny example of the elaborate psychological warfare being waged on us by the four Rockefeller Brothers to subtly pry us loose from every tradition, great and small, that tends to make us resistant to their takeover plans. Their goal, after all, is to twist the bicentennial celebration of our nation's independence and use it to silence the Liberty Bell forever. It is up to you and me, my friends to repair the crack in our Liberty Bell so that it can once again ring out loud and strong. Our beautiful Declaration of Independence was signed 200 years ago on July 4, and ever since, as a reminder of our nation's birthday each year, the Federal Fiscal Year has always begun in July, every year that is, until now. Last fall, on October 24, 1975, a chilling parody of our nation's founding document was signed, in Philadelphia no less, to enhance its historical image. It is called the Declaration of Interdependence, for which our puppet President Ford served as the advance publicity man in speeches last spring. It calls on all Americans to turn our backs on our precious independence and, quote, narrow notions of national sovereignty, unquote, in favor of what is expressly called a new world order. And my friends, you may be shocked to know that when our current fiscal year runs out on June 30, 1976, it will not be followed, as it always has in the past, by a new fiscal year beginning in July. Instead, there is to be a nameless transition period of three months, and all fiscal years thereafter are to begin in October. Why? To commemorate the signing last October of the new Rockefeller Declaration of Interdependence. Thus July 4, like Washington's birthday, is to become just another date on a calendar slipping quietly into oblivion, a relic of what our unelected rulers tell us is our obsolete, outmoded past. As we say goodbye to our Declaration of Independence, and everything it has stood for during the past 200 years, we ought to ask at least, what is it that our rulers are so anxious to have us throw away? What kind of things does it remind us of that the Rockefeller Brothers want so desperately to have us forget? The Declaration of Independence starts with the assumption that all men are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights including life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that the preservation of these is the entire purpose of legitimate government. Quote, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Unquote. And this is so basic that, quote, when a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security." Unquote. My friends, our real government today is not the one defined in our Constitution which belongs to us. We are ruled today by the Rockefeller Brothers in their empire of modern outlaws, pulling the strings and manipulating the actions of the visible governmental apparatus. So 
What were some of the elements of that design to reduce them under despotism that led to the Declaration of Independence? Why do the Rockefellers fear to have us reminded of it? Just listen to a few examples of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence and think of any parallels you can see today, and the answer will be obvious to you. Quote, he, the King, has erected multitudes of new offices and sent swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance." Unquote. What about our mushrooming Federal bureaucracy? Another quote, He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitutions and unacknowledged by our laws, given His consent to their acts of pretended legislation." Unquote. What about the super-secret White House Merge Policy Directive to Sovietize America, which I made public for the very first time last month in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 8? What about the growing mountain of unconstitutional executive orders and oppressive regulations which today constitute pretended legislation? Another complaint, quote, depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. Unquote. Our forefathers fought and died in a bloody revolution over this, yet it is only one of the many safeguards which are specifically eliminated as a right in the secret new Rockefeller Constitution which we are expected to accept this coming November. Perhaps most telling of all, quote, he has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war on us." Unquote. My friends, you and I have been declared out of the protection of our own government by the Rockefeller agents who control it. As I have documented for you in previous tapes, every remedy provided by law for the redress of such grievances as the terrible Fort Knox Twin Scandal and other such serious matters has been blocked by Rockefeller agents and fellow travelers contrary to law. Most recently, for example, my associates and I took up a Congressional challenge to state our specific charges about Fort Knox so that a grand jury might be impaneled to investigate them. The challenge was leveled by Congressman John B. Conlon of Arizona at certain of his constituents who dared to press him for action and was an act of gross hypocrisy because Congressman Conlin knew full well that those individuals were in no position to present such charges and evidence themselves. But in an open letter to Congressman Conlin dated December 7, 1976, my colleague Edward Durrell did exactly what had been asked as reviewed in complete detail in my AUDIO LETTER of last month. The result? The same studious silence and inaction from Congressman Conlon that has characterized his attitude toward Fort Knox for over a year. Whoever knows what is right to do and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. The Rockefeller Brothers are truly waging undeclared war on us. Your survival may depend on your understanding this fact. My three topics today are therefore 1. How you are a target in the secret Rockefeller takeover of the United States Postal Service. Two how the coming wars will affect you and your family, and 3. How you are to be a pawn in the game to make Nelson Rockefeller our first dictator. Topic No. 1 Two days ago, on February 14, 1976, Ford declared in a Florida campaign speech that he has had it with terrorism, and he proposed a death penalty for a range of terrorist offenses. Not long ago, 
Full-fledged terrorism was something most Americans tended to associate only with other countries. That couldn't happen here, but lately it is happening here more and more. First there was the spectacular SLA case involving Patty Hearst. More recently hundreds of grocery stores, banks, and whatnot have been bombed. On December 29, 1975, 11 people were killed and 75 injured when a bomb exploded in the passenger terminal at New York City's LaGuardia Airport, and you can rest assured that this is only the beginning. On January 13, 1976, FBI Chief Clarence Kelly helped get our bicentennial year rolling by predicting growing terrorism in America and assuring us all that the FBI is bracing itself for the worst. What you are not being told is that this new frightening problem is a carefully orchestrated part of the undeclared war being waged on you by the Rockefeller Brothers. The terrorism itself is flaring up courtesy of your friendly CIA, which was behind the SLA and LaGuardia episodes, as well as many others of lesser note. Of course, after they have given enough examples for people to copy, they fully expect a few unstable individuals here and there to decide to do the same thing, and those amateurs will be the ones who will be caught from time to time and prosecuted with great fanfare. As usual, the Rockefellers first create a problem on one hand, in this case terrorism, and then stand ready to solve this problem for us on the other hand, in this case by way of a nationwide law enforcement apparatus which they are subtly bringing under Federal control. This same technique is being applied in the related area of civil disturbances. Lodged within the so-called United States Department of Justice is a relatively new and little-known agency called the Law Enforcement Assistance Administration, or LEAA for short. In the few years of its existence, LEAA has turned into very big business indeed and is busily converting segments of your local police all around the country into regional branches of our as yet unadmitted Federal Police Force, in other words, our Gestapo. Of course Gestapo has an unpleasant ring to it, so don't expect them to name it that. These Special Duty Law Enforcement teams are for the most part not yet well known by local citizens in each area. Lately, though, a few of them have received some unwanted publicity in scattered locations around the country, so keep your eyes open. One favorite type of unit is often called a Metropolitan or Metro Police Unit. These are typically formed as a cooperative arrangement among a group of communities. Each community contributes a few of its officers to the Metro Unit, which is given jurisdiction throughout all the communities involved. The LEAA assists in getting these going by footing the bill, or most of it, with your Federal tax dollars for the first few years. Sounds nice, doesn't it? But it is the first step toward replacing your local policemen with regional cops who may feel much less attachment to you or your town. Worse yet, LEAA takes deliberate advantage of the natural tendency of most local police chiefs not to give up their best men, but to instead pawn off any troublemakers or less reliable men onto the Metro unit. It's no wonder that in one area I was recently told about, such a regional police unit has already acquired the nickname of the Storm Troopers. The residents in that area have no idea how appropriate that nickname really is. Most of this is tied in directly or indirectly with the secret Domestic Operation Garden plot about which I warned you seven months ago in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 2. Most of this huge program, which has even involved domestic war games 
and maneuvers for several years is still well hidden. One exception, although its connection with Operation Guard and Plot is not generally known, is the new breed of police usually known as Special Weapon Attack Teams or SWAT SWAT. They are the Green Berets of the police, and there is even a popular TV program to make them appear as heroes rather than the menace that they really are. True, they are frequently used right now in situations where their services may be beneficial, but this is little more than combat readiness training to ensure that they can be used for more serious purposes when the time comes. But you may say, uh, these policemen are good Americans themselves. Surely they would not allow themselves to be used as tools in setting up a dictatorship. Of course they wouldn't if they saw the situation that way, but Operation Garden Plot started nearly ten years ago in the wake of riots which were deliberately ignited in the mid-60s. All the indoctrination given to uh, these special police units is given the slant that serious civil disturbances might rise again, and that at all costs they would have to be put down to save our country. This is the diabolically clever trap being laid for us by the Rockefeller Brothers. We must stop the secret new Rockefeller Constitution before it is adopted, otherwise the streets of America will run red as frantic Americans try too late to reverse the so-called Second Revolution of the Rockefeller Brothers. Of course there may not yet be a regional police setup where you live, but something else is bound to be closer to home, the Post Office. If there is one thing Americans probably don't fear, it is the Post Office. We have been brought up to take for granted the safety, dependability, and convenience of the United States mails and that is exactly what makes it such a viable tool for the Rockefeller Brothers now that it has fallen into their clutches. On May 28, 1969, the Postal Service Act of 1969 was introduced in the House of Representatives by Congressman Morris Udall of Arizona on behalf of the Rockefeller interests who had been paving the way for it for two years. More recently, by the way, Udall has been leading the campaign to destroy your property rights by means of national land use legislation, and he has also rendered other useful services to the Rockefellers. Perhaps you have wondered how good old Mo Udall has been able to come from nowhere and receive such favorable publicity in his Presidential campaign. Now you know. After an appropriate delay to suggest due deliberation, the Postal Service Act was passed overwhelmingly by both Houses of Congress and signed into law by President Nixon late in 1970. At the stroke of a pen, the United States Post Office Department was abolished and replaced by the quasi-private U.S. Postal Service. Just as the Federal Reserve Act in 1913 handed over control of our money to the Rockefeller interests, the Postal Service Act handed them the control of our most basic communication system, the mails. Like the Federal Reserve System, the Postal Service is now privately owned, yet it retains the powers and privileges of the Federal Government, and not only was it obtained at no cost to the present owners aside from lobbying and propaganda expenses, but their investment bankers have already reaped over $50 million in brokerage fees for placing Postal Service bonds in the private market. When the Act was passed, there was lots of hoopla telling us that the new Postal Service would hold costs down by improving service, but postal rates have almost doubled already under the Postal Service, and just today the news was filled with statements that the Postal Service will just have to raise rates again due to its huge deficit a billion dollars this year alone. And as for service, the real plans of the new Postal Service Corporation when it was created were the exact opposite of the public relations promises. Plans contained in documents 
that are virtually unknown to the American people spell out a well-defined process by which Postal Service is to be progressively cut to the bone, not improved, and this process of Sovietization of our mail service is even laid out in the favorite Soviet style, a five-year plan from July 1, 1971 to June 30, 1976. The Mail Service Reduction Plan involves nine separate measures. Briefly, they are 1. Elimination of a six-day mail delivery and manned window service. 2. Consolidation of mail processing centers. 3. Individual and group production standards. 4. New techniques for carrier office work. 5. Limiting mail delivery by requiring such things as cluster boxes at trailer courts and making only one attempt to deliver a parcel post. 6. Cutting back on basic services such as smaller post offices and the number of mail collection boxes, and no longer delivering parcel post and certified mail to your home. 7. Requiring you, the customer, to do more and more of the Postal Service's work, such as coding and sorting the mail. 8. Eliminating the use of air transportation for first-class mail within 750 miles. And 9. Establishment of so-called standardized postal facilities. So far these measures sound pretty harmless, don't they? Aside from a little inconvenience, they probably don't arouse much concern on your part. That is because they were deliberately written to avoid arousing such concerns and suspicions. Each of these nine measures is described by the Postal Service itself as a, quote, stratagem, unquote. The word stratagem, my friend, means a trick in war for deceiving the enemy. We, you and I, are the enemy whom the Rockefeller Brothers intend to deceive with these bland descriptions of very important things. For example, consider Stratagem 2, Consolidation of Mail Processing Centers. This implies centralization of mail processing, which will help render the search and seizure provisions I will tell you about in a moment more powerful. It is also tied in with Stratagem 6, under which more than 3,000 post offices have already been shut down and more will be lopped off soon. Most if not all of the nine stratagems for downgrading postal service imply severe cutbacks in postal service personnel. The dwindling personnel and lengthening lines in post offices these days are only a foretaste of things to come. Last year alone over 15,000 Postal Service jobs were eliminated, and it is going to get worse as postal jobs disappear right and left. One might have expected appropriate labor spokesmen to put up a howl at such a plan, but not so George Meany, the AFL-CIO President, who really works for the Rockefeller Brothers, not his Union members. He supported this so-called postal reform thanks to a virtual a Yellow Dog contract which gave the FFL-CIO exclusive rights uh, to represent Postal Service employees without their consent. But the mere downgrading of Postal Service, swindling of Postal Service employees, and the financial milking of Postal Service assets and public cash by the Rockefeller Brothers take a back seat to far more dangerous and little-known provisions quietly written into the Postal Service Act. For example, suppose you were to write a note or a letter to a friend and then decide for some reason to take it to him yourself, or have another friend who is going that way drop it off for you. That, my friends, is a violation of Federal law, the Postal Service Act of 1969. The Rockefeller Brothers will brook no such competition with their postal monopoly. The only way you can legally take or send a letter by any means outside the Postal Service is to treat it as if you had mailed it, seal it in an envelope, address it for mailing, 
put the amount of postage on that would have been required to mail it, then cancel the stamps in ink and write the date on the envelope. If you are willing to go through all that, then you may send or take the letter by some other means other than the post office. That is, unless and until paragraph 1401B of the Postal Service Act is invoked, which allows even this privilege to be suspended. The parallels between this situation and the Stamp Act which helped bring on the American Revolution are interesting, aren't they? This virtual prohibition on carrying letters out of the mail sounds petty and greedy, but it is far more than that. It's the key to a whole range of Gestapo-style controls for search, seizure, and censorship which can now be activated at any moment. The law already exists. All that need be done is to suddenly start enforcing it. Under Paragraph 1403 of the Postal Service Act, Postal Service officers can make searches for any such illegally transported mailable items. They can stop your car and completely search it, or if they find your car parked anywhere, they can search it. If you have any package with you, for example, a birthday gift for a friend, all wrapped up with a fancy bow, they can open that up to see if you are smuggling a forbidden letter inside. Should an illegally transported letter uh, be found in such a search, it may be seized, and if it was concealed in a package or parcel, the package is simply forfeited outright. Within six months after such a seizure, the Postal Service has the option of bringing suit or other proceedings against you. It need not return your letter to you in the event of a favorable ruling and until two months after those proceedings are completed. In other words, that seemingly petty little provision about not sending a letter outside the mails, along with the other provisions dependent on it, opened the door for a wholesale detainment and searching of anyone and everyone traveling anywhere off his own property. They constitute an extremely dangerous trap ready to be used when the occasion calls for it to restrict and control your movements and activities. Any time you may be suspected of engaging in any activity the Government does not want, a postal inspection may be imposed on you to look for damaging evidence. It is only one short step further, of course, for such evidence to be planted during the search itself. Unconstitutional, you say? Of course it is. After all, it is the product of the same people who brought you Adolf Hitler and who now seek to destroy our Constitution. And what I've said is not all. There's more. For instance, there are the provisions against what is called non-mailable matter. Right now public acceptance of this concept is being promoted by applying it only to pornographic material, but later its application can be expanded to include anything our rulers find objectionable, such as criticism of their policies. Furthermore, sanctions can now be imposed on anyone who uses a fictitious name or address, and advanced fingerprint techniques can be used by the Postal Service to track down those who have handled an anonymous letter. Should the President declare a national emergency, such as he may do soon or on account of the war that's planned in the Middle East, and as is mentioned thirteen times in the secret new Rockefeller Constitution, everyone will be required by Executive Orders now in effect to register at their post office just as aliens do now. You would then be on a very short leash. The Postal Service also is given other dangerous powers, such as the power of eminent domain by which this huge private corporation can acquire your property if it so desires. So the Rockefeller Brothers are weaving their Postal Service web larger and larger out of the public eye until the day they decide to put it to use to entrap us all as a part of their undeclared war against you and me. Topic No. 2 When World War I ended, the Treaty of Versailles required the defeated Germany to pay huge war reparations to the victorious Allies. After World War II, Europe was again forced to pay reparations but you won't find them in any history book, because this time the reparations were paid not to any nation or group of nations, but to the real rulers of the Western world, the four Rockefeller Brothers. And as always, it was done at your expense. 
Here is what happened. As I explain in AUDIO BOOK No. 1 about the coming depression and war, World War II was brought about by the international Rockefeller interests and succeeded in its purpose to smash the British Empire in order to break the British boycott against the Rockefeller Standard Oil Company in the immense Saudi Arabian oil concessions. Europe was devastated in the process, however, and after the war the Rockefeller Brothers set about rebuilding Europe and Japan and their own major holdings there using American taxpayers' money as usual. It was called Foreign Aid, the Marshall Plan, and the Point Four program, among others. The Rockefellers themselves profited handsomely from all of the so-called foreign aid programs, and still do today through their multinational corporations. But for the fraction of these programs that did benefit Europe and Japan, they also laid plans to exact reparations from Europe and Japan to go into their own coffers. Three years ago in my book, The Conspiracy Against the Dollar, I showed how the Rockefeller Brothers caused the United States dollar to be divorced from its gold backing so that gold could be phased out of the international monetary system and into their own private pockets. Over two decades the Rockefeller Brothers had expanded their multinational corporations into a formidable economic force using proceeds from foreign aid as well as the tremendous profits from Saudi Arabian oil, which they obtained at a net cost of only five cents a barrel for over 30 years. In the late 1960s, foreign affiliates of the Rockefeller multinationals, armed with $200 billion, started dumping these dollars on the London gold market, forcing gold prices up there. European Central Bankers lost billions of dollars worth of gold in an attempt to keep the gold price and their own currencies stable but to no avail. The forces against them were just too great, and by March 1968 they were forced to give up, causing the establishment of the two-tier gold system. In mid-1971 these same multinationals launched another such offensive dubbed Campaign May, bombarding the uh, same central bankers of Europe with wave after wave of billions of dollars, until finally on March 1973 the central banks of Europe were forced to purchase the stolen gold reserves of the United States in Switzerland at $90 an ounce, two and one-half times the then current official price of $35 per ounce. The Rockefeller interests received $45 billion for their trouble. What thus appeared to be a soft dollar devaluation in early 1973 was actually reflecting a huge behind-the-scenes reparation payment extorted from Europe by the Rockefeller interests for their role in rebuilding Europe and Japan after World War II a war which the Rockefeller interests themselves had caused. Since that initial sale of America's gold, the Rockefeller Brothers have made windfall profits on that same gold several times over by massaging the gold market up and down, buying low and selling high. Such international economic warfare as well as the undeclared domestic warfare being waged on you and me, lies behind the theft of America's gold from Fort Knox and elsewhere, and there have been hints at least about the Fort Knox ripoff in the past. In 1968, for example, one William Ruckel's house was running for the Senate from Indiana on the Republican ticket, and he took a poke at then-President Johnson by saying, and I quote, I would that every one of our 200 million American citizens could embark on a sacred pilgrimage to Fort Knox and walk the silent passageways and view the empty vaults which were once stacked with gold." Unquote. But Ruckelhaus is now one of the Rockefeller inner circle, 
and we hear no more from him about irregularities at Fort Knox, nor do we hear about it through the major news media. Most are silent because they are under control one way or another. The remaining few who are aware of the Fort Knox situation have so far knuckled under to pressure and a completely wrong public interest argument, namely that if the truth about Fort Knox comes out, it could bring down the world's monetary system. But my friends, the Rockefeller Brothers have already done that. It is on the road to total collapse right now to suit their purposes. What exposure of the Fort Knox scandal would do is to wrestle it free from their control so that it could be rebuilt for the benefit of everyone. The news has recently included big stories about other alleged irregularities and corrupt practices within the United States Treasury. For example, Internal Revenue Service Commissioner Donald Alexander is presently under a grand jury investigation here in Washington, D.C. on corruption charges. But the biggest story of them all is Fort Knox, and though it has been 22 months since I have made my initial charges in Congressional testimony, there still is no grand jury and no Congressional investigation about Fort Knox, and the story itself remains blackballed and embargoed by the Rockefeller-controlled major media. But the strain of covering up is taking its relentless toll. As I related last month, Treasury Secretary Simon has now resorted to outright lies, saying the Central Corps vote at Fort Knox does not exist, despite our evidence to the contrary from a former Commanding General of Fort Knox and other sources. The Simon lie is now the new official line at the Treasury and is being repeated verbatim by one official after another. And poor Mary Brooks. Mrs. Brooks, of course, is the Director of the United States Mint, ostensibly so. In September 1974 she capped off the Boy Scout picnic for visitors at Fort Knox with those famous words, See? It's all here. But she later found out that my charges are true and that she had been made a fall guy by her bosses. She tried months ago to resign, as I mentioned in one of my monthly AUDIO letters, but was refused, supposedly, until it all blows over. But the strain is becoming unbearable, and reports have just surfaced to the effect that she has been under hospital care since last November for nervous exhaustion caused by worry and strain. Officially, what she is said to be worried about is the ridiculous case of several missing experimental aluminum pennies. And if you want to believe that one, go right ahead. Poor Mary Brooks is now in a very precarious situation. She has become unreliable for the conspirators, and they now have her right where they want her, in a hospital. If she is lucky, she may be allowed to resign for reasons of health, or she may be about to follow the last footsteps of Mrs. Louise Boyer for knowing too much. The successful mass media blackout on the Fort Knox Gold Scandal has now guaranteed uh, that you will face very hard economic times shortly. But still worse is the Fort Knox Plutonium Poison Scandal, which is being covered up even more brutally. It has now been four months since I first revealed that a CIA superpoison processed from deadly radioactive plutonium-239 was stored in and leaking from the central core vault of the Fort Knox Bullion Depository. Cancer figures released shortly thereafter by the government revealed an appalling 18 percent upsurge in cancer downwind of Fort Knox, but now the press is filled with efforts by the government to discredit its own figures as a fluke due to their connection with the Fort Knox situation. A month ago they also began beating the drum about other radioactive leakages allegedly discovered suddenly 
in the vicinity of Fort Knox, thereby camouflaging Fort Knox as a radiation source itself. Meanwhile, an invisible, deadly atomic plague is seeping outward from Fort Knox. The insane, inhuman plans discussed in the White House on November 8, 1975 were carried out. The contents of the leaking casks of CIA super poison stored in the Central Core Vault were dumped into the underground streams beneath Fort Knox, and now the possibility of containment of the poison is gone. It's no longer a question now, my friends, of doing what I suggested four months ago. That was to abandon the Fort Knox Boiling Depository and seal it up in a tomb of rock and lead so that its deadly contents could no longer escape. But now over 40 million people in the southeastern United States are living in what should be declared a national disaster area by President Ford. The atomic plague now spreading throughout the southeast has some similarities to the bubonic plague or Black Death that decimated Europe hundreds of years ago. Like bubonic plague germs, the CIA superpoison is invisible, tasteless, and odorless. When the bubonic plague struck Europe, it advanced relentlessly and largely out of control because modern medicine had not yet come along to educate people to the nature of the unseen danger, and today the atomic plague from Fort Knox is also advancing relentlessly and without warning, because this time the plague is man-made, and the men who made it refuse to issue the life and death warning that is needed. In the relatively low concentrations now building up in places throughout the southeast, the time lag between exposure to the plutonium poison and its deadly cancerous effect may be considerable, months or even years, varying from one place to another depending on local conditions. So if nothing is done, 40 million Americans seeing nothing wrong, unable to taste or smell the atomic plague and not being warned by the government will be taking more and more poison into their bodies, men, women, and children. By the time people start dying in alarming numbers from the cancerous effects of the poison, the Rockefeller Brothers expect to have their dictatorship in place. After all, it is down to a matter of months for them now after decades of work. If we accept their diabolical new Constitution in 1976, they will be home free, and they won't let anything get in their way if they can help it. Forty million people? Don't be silly. They've already caused the sacrifice of many times that number of lives in the 20th century in order to advance their drive for world domination. And looked at from their perspective, Forty million people are scarcely more than 1% of the world's population, hardly even a visible dip on their planning charts. President Ford knows about the hideous death threat to 40 million Americans, and it has him petrified, but in his belated efforts to break free of Nelson Rockefeller's iron grip, he is afraid his own life would be in danger if he went too far. Perhaps when he realizes that the atomic plague is also being carried toward Washington, D.C., he will conclude that he has no choice but to act. Meanwhile the grim joke is on the Rockefeller Brothers and their henchmen. Contaminated gold from Fort Knox is now stored in their hideaways in New York State and elsewhere, in banks, estates, and certain mountain caverns used as depositories by major multinational corporations uh, controlled by the Rockefeller Brothers. As I revealed two months ago in my monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 7, both Nelson Rockefeller and Henry Kissinger, among others, have inadvertently poisoned themselves by handling some of this stolen gold. That is why Nelson was described in the Westchester newspaper two weeks ago as, and I quote, "...horse, somewhat pale, 
and according to persons who have known him for years, lacking the old fire." Unquote. But we shall see. I should warn you that deteriorating health on the part of these men is not likely to save us from their plans in the slightest, just the opposite. Any sense of desperation Rockefeller may feel could cause him to try to speed up uh, his own timetable, especially since it is now considerably delayed. Meanwhile, war is imminent overseas, and there, too, you will be the one to pay for it according to present Rockefeller plans. The overall strategy is still as I explained in detail three months ago in Monthly AUDIO LETTER No. 6. It is also still targeted to begin this month or next, but two factors may cause them a slight further delay. One is the bungled CIA attack on Arab OPEC oil ministers in December, which was linked to the crisis in Lebanon. The multinationals have left Lebanon and have not returned. Please note that. The other factor is that when I was in Europe early uh, December 1975, I alerted European and OPEC governments uh, to these war plans, hoping to throw a monkey wrench into them. Whether I succeeded at all remains to be seen, but at least I am informed that Henry Kissinger is boiling mad at me now. The situation in Angola is only a small part of the overall Rockefeller Soviet plans for conquest in Asia and Africa, but the Rockefeller media are putting a heavy spotlight on it to keep your eyes off the bigger picture. It doesn't matter whether the CIA or the Soviet backed forces win in Angola since they are both in the Rockefeller orbit. Angola is primarily a stepping stone toward the takeover of rich South Africa, which has about a year to go on a three-year timetable that the Rockefeller brothers have been following. Meanwhile, the Cuban forces in Angola will shortly be shifted over to Mozambique to put pressure on Rhodesia, and very soon Congress is to be forced to take action tantamount to a declaration of war, and all sorts of emergency measures will come into force, including sedition laws which the Rockefeller Brothers may try to use to silence people like myself. Now, should that happen, I beg of you. Please don't forget my warnings, which are for your benefit. Play this and any of my other tapes you have over and over so that you will learn all you can from them to protect yourself and your family. The more completely you know and understand the truth, the less vulnerable you will be to lies and propaganda. After the war is so declared, anyone who has signed up for the highly publicized uh, food stamp program may be in for a nasty shock. This program is now controlled by Lawrence Rockefeller and has ties to the less well-known Federal Job Program, which is to provide masses of people to be sent to the Middle East to rebuild the capped-off oil wells even while there is still residual radioactivity there. But perhaps you won't be among those tricked into literally signing your life away like that, and maybe you don't have to drive much so won't be very disturbed by gas rationing. Possibly you are even among the few who have sufficient liquid assets to weather a severe depression and come out on top. And of course, the odds are four out of five that you don't live in the path of the atomic plague in the southeast United States. So why should you worry? Here's why. Once the Arab OPEC oil wells are capped off by nuclear strikes, the next step is the huge Asian war, with the United States pressed into all-out service as the factory for the Soviet Union. But that, my friends, will only be the first stage of World War III. The second stage will consist of a double-cross of the Rockefeller Brothers by the Soviet Union itself. As I warned in AUDIO BOOK No. 1, an attack on the Panama Canal will set off that war, and an attack on the Alaska oil pipeline which will be vital by then, will leave the United States virtually helpless to defend itself against a vastly superior Soviet armed might which has been built up at your expense by the Rockefellers themselves. This is the final catastrophic bottom line toward which so-called detente is leading, nuclear war, ultimately on American soil and Soviet domination of our land if we allow it to happen. Only if you and I do our part, 
passing the word and waking up the sleeping American people can this unthinkable disaster be avoided. Topic No. 3 Early last November Nelson Rockefeller publicly announced that he was bowing out as a candidate for the Vice Presidency in 1976. I warned then that his Vice Presidential withdrawal was only a trap for the unwary, and on February 4, 1976, he himself said practically the same thing I told you last November. Rockefeller's words were, and I quote, I withdrew as Vice President. My statement includes the Vice Presidency only." Unquote. And in just a few days, on February 19, 1976, Nelson Rockefeller plans to burst into the Presidential Campaign Arena, stealing the spotlight from everyone else in coming weeks and focusing it on himself. Since becoming Vice President under the 25th Amendment, which he himself engineered into the Constitution, Rockefeller has been thwarted several times in his efforts to replace Gerald Ford in the Oval Office. Most recently Ford was supposed to get out of the way in time for Rockefeller to give the State of the Union speech as President, but for some time now Richard Nixon has been calling Ford almost daily to say, Hang in there, Jerry, while Rockefeller keeps pressuring him to get out. It is a question right now of who has the worst blackmail material on Ford, Nixon or Rockefeller? So far Nixon has been able to keep the upper hand in this tug of war. So it was back to the drawing boards again for Nelson Rockefeller, and he's determined not to be thwarted again. Ford stammered and fumbled his way through an insignificant State of the Union address as if reading it for the first time, which he may have been since it was worked up practically at the last minute. Meanwhile, the electrifying State of the Union message Rockefeller had planned to deliver will now be delivered a chunk at a time in a little over ten speeches. He will be speaking about things no other candidate does, fundamental matters that look far beyond mere current issues. Just as a Rockefeller puppet named Franklin Delano Roosevelt called for a new deal in a time of national trial, Nelson Rockefeller would try to convince us of the pressing need for a new balance between the public and private sectors. Rockefeller's ideas and proposals will be controversial, but in the coming months you will be battered and buffeted by escalating problems that are intended to make Rockefeller's ideas look more and more attractive to you, and to help calm any residual fears you may have that Rockefeller's proposals are too radical or dangerous the instant conservative strategy which began last summer will be brought into play. Several months ago I explained the role that AFL-CIO President George Meany is to play in this, and he can hardly wait for the go-ahead to publicly endorse Rockefeller. Just today, February 16, Meany announced that AFL-CIO will not endorse a Democrat prior to Convention time. A few days ago Rockefeller's instant conservative strategy shifted into high gear. Senator Barry Goldwater, who is perhaps the biggest Rockefeller Trojan horse of all, has now endorsed Rockefeller for President, saying he has changed his liberal ways. Since last May I have tried first privately, then through public appeals, to get Goldwater to release crucial Fort Knox evidence in his possession which was obtained from the widow of a man who died suddenly under very strange circumstances. But Mr. Conservative refuses to cooperate and is still sitting on that evidence to this very day. Now we have the public proof of the reason, which I have known privately for some time. Goldwater's evidence would tend to implicate the four Rockefeller brothers, and Goldwater, who has sometimes been called the conscience of the Senate, by the increasingly generous Rockefeller media of late, is himself a keystone of Nelson Rockefeller's instant conservative strategy to deceive you. By the time Ronald Reagan becomes Rockefeller's vice presidential running mate, the plan is for Rockefeller's magical transformation in the public eye to be complete. Meanwhile, things will be going from bad to worse. 
crisis heaped upon crisis. On Jefferson's birthday, April 13, 1976, the new $2 bill is to be introduced, highlighting the inflation that is sending the dollar into oblivion, or a moratorium. Simon's so-called red-back dollars, described in my AudioBook No. 1, are getting closer and closer. The risk of losing your job is also going up and up. My latest confidential information, direct from within the Bureau of Labor Statistics, is an unemployment level of 18.3 percent, up 3 percent in only a month's time. Meanwhile, the papered-over financial collapse of New York City and State is still progressing and will shortly surface again in dramatic fashion. The stock market hangs high, but it hangs by a thread, and confidence in the nation's banks is being whittled away steadily because only today another large bank failed, the Hamilton National Bank of Chattanooga, Tennessee, with assets of half a billion dollars. With the Mideast War is to come gas rationing, and with it a whole new era of shortages. The deep drought in the Great Plains that is now developing was predicted for me two years ago by oil experts who told me that deliberately excessive rates of domestic oil production were gradually lowering the water table in that part of the country and would soon bring back the Dust Bowl conditions of the 1930s. Our huge grain surpluses of recent years, of course, are now stored in the Soviet Union, so you and your family will be the ones affected by shortages. Nelson Rockefeller is determined to run as our incumbent President next November. After conspiring for over 20 years, spending $25 million to get himself confirmed, and forcing Congress to seal damaging testimony for 50 years, he does not intend to be stopped again. When the time is ripe this time, Gerald Ford will depart from the scene one way or another. If our beloved land is to be saved, it is up to us you and me to do it. The only weapon we have is the truth, made known to everyone. And in AudioBook No. 6 on what we can do to save America, I have tried to explain exactly how we can do it. If you have some better ideas, fine, please go to it. But we must, each of us, do what we can, whether it seems great or small, and we must do it now. We are in the last lap of a long, long race, and the prize is our own freedom. Like an Olympic runner, we must get our second wind now and run as if our lives were at stake, because, dear friends, they are. Until next month, this is Dr. Beter. Thank you, and may God bless each and every one of you.